So good afternoon, every uh, evening, I think, already, everyone. Um, I'm just going to talk about shortly, um, give an overview of uh, how I combine music and mathematics. So these are two fields, passions, and uh, there's three projects I'm going to talk about. But before that, to start, I will just give you an uh, overview how I came to um, combining music and mathematics because I didn't do it overnight. It took some years to find different ways to combine the two. Um, and that's a little bit in introductory part, so uh, about the background and how, what my motivation was and is. So originally, this is um, the first page of my PhD. Probably nobody, are there mathematicians here? I don't think so. Normally there's not a, <laughs> It's not a lot of mathematicians. So um, originally I started off uh, as a pure mathematician, as they call it, and um, I um, did a PhD in the field of superstring theory. Uh, so that's an area of theoretical physics um, which is now being explored more and more. Now, after that was in 2001 that I finished uh, the PhD. Uh, in mathematics, but I've always was and am also very fascinated by music. And so that's a little bit the reason why after this uh, study in mathematics, I looked for ways to, to get more music in uh, the mathematical ideas and techniques that I wanted to explore. And this is how I um, ended up working for a couple of years, for four years, at the Institute for Psychoacoustics and Electronic Music. So that's a part of University of Ghent. So I come from Ghent. It's a little town in Belgium, in the northern part. Um, and there I was uh, doing research on music and emotions. So the idea was to see if you can describe emotions that you have, if you hopefully, hopefully have listened to music, you can describe them using mathematical models and if you could do something with those models. I will come back to that later. Um, and then, after uh, doing this research at so this institute, I was starting to work with interactive musical projects. But I, yeah, I felt that I missed uh, a lot of knowledge from music. Um, so I had no formal training, and that's why I decided to um, uh, study music composition at the Royal Conservatory in Ghent. So again, the city where I live for the moment. Now, uh, during all this time, that's another uh, aspect. Uh, I've also been working, and I still do it today, as a consultant in applied mathematics and uh, art, you could say, mathematical modeling. So, um, and I also start now, in the beginning, it was very separated, this work from my artwork, but I also found ways to start to integrate that into my artistic work. So, this is really, Hardcore, boring mathematics, probably for uh, most of you. <laughs> but you can do stuff with it. Uh, I will show you. Now, um, everything starts in my work um, with a belief. That's my personal belief. Um, of course, we have a lot of art science projects. Uh, and it's an old idea that there is no boundary between those two. It, it comes from the Greek. When you look at the old Greek, um, <clears throat> Uh, science division, you could say. There was no distinction, as we know, between music and, and mathematics and physics. So, uh, but I really, it's from a personal experience that for me, mathematics is also very artistic. Yeah. Doing, creating mathematics is really an art form. It's, it's a very intuitive process because most people think it's very rational, but for me, it's not the case. So, um, these are two people who, uh, for me, are in important and inspiring for the work that I will explain to you about. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows one of those two, probably not. Yeah, The left one is, uh, he's a mathematician, you see again, mathematics. Um, his name is Kurt Gödel. 
He's a mathematician from the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and why he, is he important? He's very important into the um, uh, artificial intelligence. Even today, his work is very relevant. Uh, what did he um, investigate? Kurt Schödel, he proved, so it, there's a lot of things to do nowadays about artificial intelligence, robots taking over our jobs, robots taking over our privacy, uh, everything is going to be digitized, robots are going to become smarter than us, this is the singularity theory, but the work of Kurt Schödel counter, counter contradicts this. So what he did in the 1920s, 1921 to be more precise, in 1921, he proved that you cannot learn a computer what the real numbers are. So a computer is not able to understand what one, two, three, four, five, with you can add numbers, that's also a concept, and there is a zero, and if you add a number with zero, you get the same number. This is not possible in a computer. A computer will never understand this. And this is a very important argument because if a computer cannot understand numbers, how on earth would it ever be able to speak or to understand emotions or language? This is, yeah. For me, this guy is very important because I'm also working with artificial intelligence. So, and you have to make a stance as an artist also, uh, what your belief system is. Uh, the other uh, guy here, that's uh, Wittgenstein. Um, and Wittgenstein, <clears throat> he was living a little bit in the same period. Why is he important for me? He was stating the same so, um, theory as Gödel, but for language. So Kurt Gödel says there is a distinction between mathematics and reality. There's always a gap. Mathematics does not describe completely reality. And Wittgenstein said the same for language. He's investigating the gap you have if you use language to describe reality. There's always a gap. And this gap is for me very interesting because this gap can be filled with the art part. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm said I'm going to talk about three projects, concrete projects, in which I, starting from those ideologies, um, worked on combining music and mathematics. And the first is called EmoSynth. So this was the first project that I did in uh, 2007. Uh, I started developing this uh, with a small team. Um, uh, it was supported by the Flemish authorities, so the Flemish government gave me a budget. And what was the idea of, and is the idea of EmoSynth? The EmoSynth is a system that is an, sort of an emotional intelligent iPod system. It is a system that can automatically generate personalized soundtracks that have a maximal emotional impact for the person who is using this system. So, in concrete, how can you use it? Practically, practically you can use it that you go to the cinema, you have headphones on, um, and the system will generate a soundtrack specially made for you that can be completely different than the soundtrack for your neighbor, neighboring uh, person. Now, how does it work? It uses biofeedback, so wearables. These are also very popular uh, nowadays, again. Uh, and it uses artificial intelligence. So the wearables that I'm using for EmoSynth, are, yeah, there you see it a little bit. Um, we were using heart rate measuring devices and stress level, uh, measure, measuring leveling, <laughs> stress uh, level measuring devices. So those two parameters. And to use the system, you first, it's like a little child. You have to train it. So you couple yourself with the biosensors to the system. It's a software, it's a software program. And it's during the training phase, the EmoSynth will try to get you in four different kind of emotional states. It will try to make you calm down using music that it generates on the fly. So the music is we call it algorithmically generated, so it doesn't exist. It's an algorithm that makes music. And it's a sort of an intelligent trial and error process using a technique from AI, which is called genetic programming, such that it looks for the right kind of musical spheres it has to create to make you calm down. Once it learned that, the emocent will try to get you a little bit less calm down, so a little bit stressed. Once that is being trained, it will try to get you more stressed. And at the end, the fourth phase, we call it, it make what tries to make you really, really stressed using these um, algorithmic 
models that are inside a computer. Once you've trained it, you have, a, we call it an emotional response profile. So this is like information inside a computer that states to get you in this state, I have to do this and this and that, etc. After you've trained it, you can, uh, so we used it. Here you see it's a uh, performance that we did at the Musical Instruments Museum in Brussels. So that's also in Belgium. We used it to automatically generate soundtracks for old black and white movies. So for, we, here we were using The Phantom of the Opera from Julian Rupert. Why we, did we do that? Because we wanted to confront a completely new technology with very old ideas. Normally, The Phantom of the Opera, this is a movie by Julian Rupert from 1927. There's a piano player normally playing, but we threw away the piano player and we replaced it by the technology of the Emocent. Now, during the live performance, so this person was trained to the Emocent, and she is now listening to a personalized soundtrack generated by the Emocent, so this is all this hardware. And you see also here a musician. That is because the Emocent for music generation, it will use three sources. It can use audio material, audio loops that it will mix. That's the first source. Second source is it can play notes. So this, this is, for technical terms, it's MIDI data that's being generated by the system. And you can attach synthesizers to that. And the third is it also genera generates uh, live scores. There's somewhere a screen here. And <clears throat> the musicians are being directed by the Emocent using annotations on those scores, on the screens. <clears throat> we, um, this is, was also an idea that we had to integrate <clears throat> live musicians because I didn't want it, the performance to be like a lot of multimedia acts that there is an artist sitting behind a computer and press spacebar and the thing starts and that's it. I mean, I don't think that's interesting, so yeah. Uh, briefly, the technology uh, that was used for Emocent, um, <clears throat> so we used a lot of techniques coming from a field, it's called creative evolutionary systems design. So it's a theory uh, in which people, you try to emulate human creativity using a computer. That's basically it. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's old. I mean, it's, uh, it's already evolved. In the, these are projects from the 90s. This is a very famous program, Fox Populi. You can find it online. These are <clears throat> sev uh, gener uh, similar algorithms generating visuals. Um, so that's one factor that we used. The second domain that we were using was a domain called effective computing. So here you see, this is a, a robot developed in 94. It's in the museum of MIT, and the name of the robot, robot is Kismet. So it's an effective robot, and it has a sort of an effective expression. It can smile, be angry, it can talk to you. It has a sort of a throat system. Um, but effective computing focuses on connecting man and machine using emotions. And that's what we were doing using Emosense. And to connect those emotions, we were using biosensors, biofeedback, wearables. But at that time that we were developing this project, it was 2007, it was not common to do that. So the first biosensor that we were using is this one. It cost us 3,000 euros. So and nowadays, we all know you have them for free on your smartphones. You have a brainwave scanner for $140 that you can hack and do stuff with. So it evolved very quickly after we uh, did this project. I mean, nowadays, 10 years later. Um, but we were using uh, biofeedback and also psychophysiology that's trying to connect the data coming out of the wearables to your emotional states. It's not so easy because using normal wearables you can only s trigger your emotional intensity that you have but not emotions in classical psychology are classified using an intensity. It can be strong or low and a valence um, an emotion can be positive or negative. For example, anger is negative and has a strong, a strong value. Depressed is, has a low value and is, again, negative. But using normal biosensors, as we call them, wearables, you can only measure the intensity of the emotion, not the valence. Uh, this is a performance a long time ago uh, in Liebig Gallery, Liebigstrasse here in Berlin. Um, with a dancer, so we were experimenting if a dancer could also influence the system. Um, 
Now, um, this is a functional diagram of this EmoSynth system, and you can replace EmoSynth with another system, you can replace image sound with another artifact, uh, painting or movie or whatever. And this is a diagram how it works in the ideal case. So you have a subject, uh, so the person that's being trained to the system. There's a measurement of the psychophysiological response. Well, first there's image and sound being generated. The emotion listens and undergoes the image and sound. Measurement of the psychophysiological response, so these are the wearable responses, goes into the EmoSynth. EmoSynth gets the data, uses artificial intelligence, and tries to generate new kind of image and sounds to direct the subject in maybe another state, and you have a sort of a feedback loop. That's the, the theoretical way that the EmoSynth works or should work because for the moment there is no real feedback. So uh, the point is, once you train the EmoSynth, you train it today, you use it tomorrow. But if you use it tomorrow to generate a soundtrack for a movie, there's no changing of the, of the model, of the, the, your, the response model anymore. So, but this is the ideal case. So, um, of course, um, and this is a classical, it's a classical example, EmoSynth of an inter interactive multimedia system. And what is classical in interactive multimedia system is that you get new paradigms in art. You get new connections between the tree in the triad in art. You have the artist, you have the audience, and you have here the music. The question is, who is uh, the author of the music that's being generated? Is it me who programmed the system, who developed the algorithms? Is it the person who is attached to the bias sensors because he or she influences the music? Uh, the music itself, who is the, um, it, where there's no score, so it's really virtual, it is non-existing. This also gives very interesting problems for the GEMA, for example. If, if yeah, we do a concert and somebody wants to, to write a letter to the GEMA, I mean, the music does not exist. So, so these are all interesting new paradigms. And systems like EmoSynth, uh, there are similar systems now being developed by, by streaming services like Deezer is trying to pick out the right kind of music for you. It's more and more also being uh, getting into the commercial streaming circuit. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not the first working with biofeedback. There's a whole history of uh, using biofeedback for uh, artistic purposes. This is the first, one of the first performances ever made by Alvin Lucier in 1965. And it's called Music for Solo Performer. It's a performance with percussive instruments and brainwaves in 1965. If you're interested, you can check it on YouTube. You find the, the original recording. It's a very famous, important performance, uh, and from that, uh, to, uh, from that moment on, biofeedback was very popular, not popular, very popular, it's been in waves. And now I have the feeling again there's a boost again, uh, of course connected with the new evolutions in artificial intelligence. So that's the first project, combining emotions and music and mathematics. The second is um, I want to talk about is uh, Micromeras, and Micromeras is we call it a space sound project. Um, it originated from a work which was commissioned to me by the Dutch Electronic Arts Festival, uh, the, uh, the DEF Festival in Rotterdam. In 2014, they commissioned a work uh, uh, to me to um, make a work with sound and astrophysics space. That was a topic of the festival. So I started to think how to combine those two. And then um, I had to, yeah, I, I thought a little bit. And then um, I started, I, I decided to use the idea and the ideology or the techniques from uh, hip hop. Uh, because and apply that to this project. So in hip hop, it, as we all know, how did it arise? People were taking um, uh, breaks, coming from funk records, from disco records, cutting that up, uh, and then there was an uh, they played it. There was an MC, uh, MCing on top of that. So I decided to have the same strategy, but only my funk and disc records uh, uh, should 
originate or from space or from deep space. And deep space is the region outside our solar system. So beyond uh, the furthest planet that we know in our solar system. Now, um, what are those sources, those data sources? There's two sources that I'm using for this project. One is um, a lot of recordings that I'm using from the NASA and the ESA, and typically from the Voyager satellites. So these are the two satellites which were launched in the end of the 70s. And what the NASA has done is transformed a lot of data that those satellites capture. Uh, and the data contains mostly electromagnetic radiation, and electromagnetic radiation is radiation which is being emitted by this light, for example. So in physics, every astrophysical object, a star, uh, a planet, uh, a pulsar star, a black hole, it's a uh, black hole, not completely, um, it will emit a certain kind of, as we call it, electromagnetic radiation. And the Voyager satellites, so this is one of the two satellites, there are two, they pass along, for example, say uh, Saturn, and they capture all the electromagnetic radiation, and the NASA gets, gets those data on Earth, and then they use techniques coming from the, a field which is called data sonification to transform those waves into sound. And they publish everything uh, online, so you can find all those materials online. So I was using those recordings, and as a second source, I'm also using real numbers. Number streams, so really boring like Excels, you could say, with all kinds of numbers. And then I'm using also data sonification techniques and software like, I don't, maybe somebody knows this software, very popular in the electronic music, well, the experimental scene. This is Max, Max MSP. Yeah. So you can use Max, uh, you can use uh, other open source software like Pure Data, to transform those numbers into sounds, to make them hearable. And those two sources I'm using uh, in my studio, and then I make tracks with them, with a certain theme. Um, for the Dutch Electronic Arts Festival, the theme was the voyage from Earth to the furthest exoplanet that we know, to put that vo uh, voyage, uh, make it audible, make a sort of an audible voyage for the persons who are listening to it. I was interested if you could audify it, uh, because, of course, if you go to a planetarium, they can show you the images, the visual part of it, but for me, the quest is, can you also reach the same purpose only with sound? Um, data sonification is a uh, field which is rather new, and it was successfully applied in the study of the sun. Yeah. The problem with the sun is if you want to study the internal workings of the sun, so what's going on inside of the sun, in the core, there's a lot of uh, energy and thermonuclear reactions. The problem is if you want to do it with a, a probe, a satellite, you send the satellite here and here it burns. It's so hot, you cannot, you cannot reach it. And so astrophysicists had to find other ways to try to figure out the internal workings of the sun, and that's where the data sonification was very handy. What they did was they captured certain kind of radiation which was being emitted by the core of the sun using special kind of techniques. They turned it into sound, and in this way they discovered a whole new things about the internal workings of the sun. Yeah. This is a classical example of how data sonification can be used to um, gain, uh, to, to have, to augment knowledge in astrophysics. And this is a next phase in which I want to draw the Micrometas project as an analog key to this is um, using, so, and this is where the, the first slide of, the, of the, the, the part on the theoretical physics comes back again. Um, originally, when I studied, started mathematics, uh, doing uh, the PhD, I was very interested into, yeah, it's a, a problem in theoretical physics which is called the Great Unification Theory. And in theoretical physics, there's a big problem because we have two theories. As maybe you know, we have uh, the Relativity Theory from Einstein, and the Relativity Theory will describe everything that is very heavy or moves super, super fast. If you have something like that, you need relativity theory. But if you 
want to study something that is super very small, like an electron or a core of an atom or even smaller, you need another theory which is called quantum mechanics. Maybe you, that you heard about this quantum mechanics. It's a very strange world, the world of little particles. But the problem with the two theories is that they're not compatible. You cannot have one theory that encompasses the two. And sometimes in some situations, in studying the galaxy, you need two, the two theories. And a special situation in which you would need the two theories is the study of the, the, how the, of the Big Bang, how everything started. Because when everything started, everything was super small, as we know, this is a theory, of course. It was super dense. It was a lot of um, energy and a lot of it was super heavy. And for that, you need the both. Uh, and the last, I think, oh, let's say, last from the 1970s on, 1980s, physicists have been looking and looking for theories to combine those two. And those efforts to do that is called um, uh, quant uh, quantum gravity. That's a whole field in theoretical physics. And why is this so important for me? Because I was already interested before I was doing mathematics in this typical problem. Uh, and how can you connect that to the Sun and to the Micrometas project, to the art stuff? Well, in the next phase, I would like to, um, as an analogy, there is a, a very powerful object in quantum gravity, and that is a black hole. So a black hole is a, a point in, uh, in space-time, as they call it, which is infinitely heavy and which attracts everything that comes in its neighborhood. And you can never get out. It's a very special, crazy world uh, that you have. And a black hole, there's a sort of an, uh, it's called an event horizon, a point of a region of no return around this uh, black hole. And physicists don't, do not know what happens inside this uh, event horizon. They, probably the world of physics, the world is completely different than our world. And in the next phase, in the Micrometas, I'm looking to try to, with mathematical models and computers, model the inside of such a black hole, get data out, and make music with it. That's basically uh, yeah. a little bit uh, parallel with the workings of the sun, uh, how they use data sonification to study the core. I will just uh, now let you hear a short fragment, because this is all maybe weird and abstract how it sounds if you're starting to make music with astrophysical data. So first I'm gonna, so this is a track where there's a lot of oh, information from our solar system being used. I have to check iTunes, yes. It gives you a little bit an impression uh, of uh, yeah, how it can be to tr travel with sound in space. Now, the second example that I will uh, show uh, is a track made using data coming from pulsar stars. And pulsar stars are very special kind of stars in our galaxies. Um, a pulsar star is a sort of a light beacon. You can compare it to a sort of a light beacon, but it does not emit light, but very, very powerful beams of energy. Uh, 
Yeah. And the point is, it turns like this, these beams, and if Earth is, is here, then you have connection, no connection, connection, no connection, connection, and you get a sort of a, a ticking system. They were first discovered in the 60s, so, um, and they spin very fast. They can spin to over uh, 800 times per second, and you have to know that these stars are uh, super massive, so they are much more, uh, much more mass than our sun, so these are crazy, crazy uh, objects. Uh, and I've been using the data coming from those pulsar stars in the next track. And the, the nice thing is, um, this is from a pulsar. There's pulsar stars that are at a distance of 21,000 light years from Earth. So this means that the data that's being used in this track is 21,000 years old. So uh, this is maybe a track with one of the oldest samples, I think. Um, you can go even further and back in time because I'm a little bit obsessed with trying to go further and further and further. Um, of course, you can go much more way back in time. Uh, that would mean that you'd use the um, uh, background radiation, as it's called, because if the universe started to exist with the Big Bang, there's a lot of noise still from that. But the problem is this noise is not interesting. It's just noise. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, of course, I edit everything in my studio. So I have a, a little production studio in Belgium. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to equalize everything, to compress it, to put some effects on it. I'm also using a lot of, it's called resynthesis techniques, granular synthesis. I'm also a big fan of that. To, I try to make it so that the, the tracks have a sort of an emotional impact, although it has no rhythm, it has no tonal, it has no melody, but it's just sound. So these are the pulsar stars. This is one. This is another one. These are three pulsars. I just played around with them to get rhythms with those uh, very old data streams. This is another one. That's the 121,000 light years from Earth, this one. you hear it becomes a little bit metallic, that's because I'm using, it's called comb filtering. Uh, it's a sort of kind of a, an audio filter, which is, uh, yeah, comes from a certain synthesis technique, so, uh, yeah. All right, then, uh, so these are the two first projects, and now I'm gonna try to put it in full screen, yes. So, it's like this, yes, okay, that's the last project I uh, want to talk about. Uh, this is called Crystal Ball. And now it's running automatically. That's not the aim. I have to... Oh, yes. So Crystal Ball is a more, a, a, you could say, a politically engaged project. And the background between this project is, as a mathematician, my own, um, uh, you could say, um, not frustration. And now it's running again. How is it possible? Um, about the misuse, it's on the misuse of mathematics in uh, the financial industry. So, and you can also enlarge it, the misuse of mathematics and science in our whole um, evolution of technology. Yeah, because we believe, we are uh, supposed to believe that technology is gonna save us all and gonna solve all our problems. It's gonna solve the environmental problems. Uh, it's going to solve our uh, problems with the financial markets to get everything under control. It's going to solve our health problems in the future. Uh, but I'm very sceptic about it because it also has a very, it has a dark side. And also, as a mathematician, 
if you look at the models, for example, that are being used in the financial industry, they are very beautiful from a mathematical point of view. Oh man, yeah, the theories, but they don't, they do not work. Why? Because they pre-assume that we are all robots and they can perfectly predict how we behave and how our reactions are. And the point is, banks have and are use those models and those philosophy to say, you don't understand what's going on, let us, and we have a team of 100 engineers, and let us do the mathematics and you'll be okay. But if you look deeper, a lot of banks are using this strategy to cover up fraud. <clears throat> Just massive fraud. I studied the crisis, the mathematics, and what you learn is, if you steal, do not steal an apple. Steal one billion euros and you will get away with it. You know, that's, that's the, the whole thing that you can learn about it. So that's the background of the crystal ball project. What I'm doing with this crystal ball project is I'm uh, using mathematical models from financial world, from Wall Street, and I'm turning them into compositional instruments. Yeah. Using techniques coming from a field which is called, I already tackled it, um, here, algorithmic music composition. So in algorithmic music composition, you use algorithms. They can be put in a computer, but they can also be algorithms that work with cards or other kind of stuff with um, uh, double scene, I don't know, in, in, with uh, dice, dice in English, uh, to make music, yeah. Um, I'm very inspired in this project by the work by Ianis Xenakis. He's a Greek-French composer who lived in the 60s. He's written a book in 68, music, uh, formalized music, Musique Formelle. And Xenakis is at the heart of all our digital media that we're using today. So in this book in 68, he describes the whole system that we use in Adobe Premiere, for example, or in um, Pro Tools or in Ableton Live. So, yeah. But Xenakis was also famous because he was using mathematics to make music. So I'm extending his ideology, his ideology and using the mathematics from financial industry. This is to give you an idea of algorithmic music composition. This was already being used by this guy. Hopefully you know who this is. This is it's Mozart, yes, thank you. Um, he was also using some sort of algorithmic techniques. Why? Because he written so much music and sometimes he just, he had no inspiration, you know, he had to go further. So he was using dice or other kind of things with cards or to have inspiration. Uh, another famous example, and I'm showing this because this album was, ah, okay, Berlin was very important for this album, as you all know. So this is Low by David Bowie. Uh, composed and uh, it was uh, issued in 74. This is a producer, Brian Eno, uh, some of you might know, who still is uh, working in the electronic music scene and is a producer today. Um, what is the story behind Low? So David Bowie had a lot of problems with, uh, he had a lot of drug problems, so he tr he, his idea was to come to Berlin to, <laughs> to get uh, another perspective. Um, and because his lifestyle, he didn't have a lot of inspiration. And that's why Brian Eno, he invented a sort of a system, you can still find it online, um, a sort of an algorithmic music composition system with cards. And you can also make lyrics with it. And the whole album Low was composed in this manner. Yeah, this is a famous example. Um, for the Crystal Ball project, two other important figures for me. So this is Yanis Xenakis. So you see his eye is, uh, it was shattered by the Greek Civil War. So he had a, a shell of a grenade in his eye. Um, and he had also hearing uh, problems because of that. And this other person, very important for algorithmic music composition is uh, John Cage. Yeah, as you might maybe know. Okay, so this is, just to give you an example, a score of Xenakis from uh, in the 50s, who was using also scientific methods to make music, but he didn't have a computer, so he used scientific paper. Um, I was just, to, before the Q&A, give you an example of a track of the Crystal Ball project, how it sounds. So...
Uh, of course, it's it's my own. I do stuff with those algorithms I like. It's rather dark, but that's the whole crystal ball. The theme is also rather dark. So, uh, but you could somebody else would do other stuff with those algorithms. Um, for those of you who might be interested to learn more, I'll just this is a little publicity. Yes, there's a, a workshop I'll be giving in uh, Spectrum. And the people from Spectrum were also talking here today. Oh, it's going back. Um, it's a it's a workshop on a, so the title is use, uh, using uh, chance and randomness for multimedia art and music. So it's a workshop on uh, on the techniques that I'm using in the Crystal Ball project, uh, and it's mostly it's all in open source software that the things are going to be taught. So we're using we're going to use processing. We're going to use uh, pure data. So um, if you're interested, so there's also, I have a website. Uh, and if you go to the website, so that's my name.net, uh, there's a section workshops, and there you find information if you would want to join the workshop. So it runs uh, from the 28th of May, the workshop, till the 2nd of June in Spectrum. So well, again, Spectrum Art Science Community here in Berlin. So, okay. Um, and I think, yeah, if somebody has questions, yeah, we have some time for some questions. I don't know. Yeah, hello. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering um, how you actually translated the wave the, the, the signals, for instance, you took from uh, deep space into sound. Did you apply, because you, you, you had that uh, sample metaphor, so did you, for instance, use a, a sine wave, or did you use a square wave? Or, I know it gets maybe a little bit geeky, That's but... Technical, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, 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 it's okay, yeah. No, um, I, I'm not... So the, the thing that you're, you're talking is indeed you could, you could... The simplest thing to do is connect the data with pitch of a wave, of a sine wave or as a square wave. Uh, but I'm using other techniques. So what I mostly do is I have some more interesting synthesis algorithms, and then I have like FM synthesis or granular, and then I have parameters mapped to those data streams. Yeah. And in this way, um, you can develop your own language as a composer, because I like FM synthesis, I like um, a granular synthesis, um, to transform those data streams into sounds. And somebody else would do something completely different. Somebody else would maybe um, uh, map the data to pitch of, of a square wave or something else. So it depends on the person. But I, yeah, I'm also very into nice textures and electronic organic sounds and I'm looking for ways to combine it via streams controlling parameters of those sounds yeah that's how I do it yeah thank you yeah there's somebody there um, my question is with the second and the third project, do you yes. use the music in any way or do you showcase it in any way besides something around here? I mean, with the first one, you could see it's a performance, but yeah. how did you publish the second and third one? Ah, the second and third. Well, um, I, I play uh, concerts with that. So, but it's more on uh, festivals for ele experimental electronic music. And um, what I tend to do during those concerts is, for the Micromedas projects, um, I tend to use live streams from satellites, turn them into sounds, and combine that with the tracks. It, there I'm using a basic technique of other electronic musicians. I have Ableton Live, we all know it. I have some uh, loops, and then I start to mix everything. But I mix it also with uh, sonified live streams of astrophysical uh, data. So, yeah. And those data, those live streams, they come from websites, from NASA. I'm using a lot of data from NASA. Yeah, they publish it online. Uh, but now I'm, I'm more looking to get even 
more peculiar information uh, because uh, the problem is with online data, it's limited. It has limitations. Um, and I was also in contact with people from NASA to get more because they publish the data once per, one time per minute as a refresh rate. But of course, I want more data, you know, one time per minute. So what I do in between, I use a technique called interpolation, mathematical interpolation, to say if it is there in one minute one and two in minutes uh, there in minute two, probably it will go like this. Then I started using more advanced techniques, adding some noise to that so that it goes like this to make it more interesting. But of course, it would be nice to have also the data in between those the minutes. But the problem is, NASA cannot give it to private persons because of military reasons. They are very... Yeah, the, because I could misuse it, send it to the Russians or I don't know where, to North Korea, <laughs> and then they could misuse it, for example. Yeah. Um, but now I'm looking for organizations to, that will allow me to have more, more specific data. So, uh, and as to the second project, uh, the crystal ball project, there's also concerts, a little bit in the same format as uh, Micrometas. And there I'm also planning to uh, use the algorithms uh, on the fly. So also live using the algorithms. But the, the point is, and that's also the experience that I have, you have to be very careful using live data streams or algorithms because sometimes they can go very wild and then you have to turn down the fader uh, because it's programmed in Max Pure Data, and that's the problem of those. Uh, well, it's it's a, it's a it's a property of those software uh, packages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So other questions, remarks. Um, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Have you thought about like setting up your own uh, data sources for astronomical data? Uh, yes, I know it is possible, yeah. but not. Uh, no, I haven't because I'm not. I, I have no knowledge of. Uh, then you have to know about telescope, uh, uh, as radio astronomy and stuff like that. Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. It could. I mean, for that you have to collaborate. Uh, of course, another possibility what you can do is higher time of on a telescope. That's also possible. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't explored these directions yet. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, there's one thing I forgot. Maybe I also show it shortly. So I talked about the EmoSynth. Maybe you want also, I will show you a short video fragment that you can get an idea how it looks and how it sounds. So uh, this is a video fragment of a performance that we did in uh, Belgium. Uh, and the Emocent here is trying to make a soundtrack for one person for The Phantom of the Opera from Julian Rupert from 1927. And the Emocent has can generate different kind of musical styles. And in this video fragment, you will see the Emocent is um, programmed to generate jazz music. It's rather jazz music combined with electronics that is being played by the system. So um, I will... Yes, it's here, this video. So I'm going to check the beginning. Yeah. So I will show you two fragments. The first in which the emocent is trying to make the person relaxed uh, with the scene. So this is the opening scene of the Phantom of the Opera. And as we, yeah, probably you know the story of the Phantom of the Opera. At the end, the phantom is being chased by the people. And there, I will also show the fragment in which the emocent is trying to make the person who is watching it stressed. So... <laughs>
So there's a, you see it, there's a, do, a double bass player that uh, we hired, there's a guitar player, and there's a drummer. So those, those are jazz musicians. So, uh, yeah. Uh, at the, so now I will scroll over because the video is 10 minutes. I'm not going to show everything. You can also check it on the website, this video. It's also on the website. I'm going to check here. So here it goes wrong for the Phantom. <laughs> see the screens with the scores sometimes uh, coming into screen. Um, we have to experiment a little bit with those scores so uh, to make it work. Okay. So, and a few, yeah. I don't know if there's still questions or remarks. Yes, in the back. Yeah, about the Phantom of the Opera example. Yes. So the was the score generated by the Yes. AI? The okay. score is also al algorithmically generated, so it doesn't exist. Yeah. So you press and it's it appears. Yeah. We had a lot of fun programming it. Uh, it was in the summer that we programmed. Uh, I had the programmers, uh, one one programmer. Uh, and we could make thousands of songs, you know, and we'd listen and sometimes something nice would come out. So, yeah, uh, there's also, this is in connection, of course, with the GEMA thing. There's a, a, an artist, I think he's from Berlin, maybe, Johannes Kreidler. He made fun out of it. So what he did was like make zillion of tracks using little samples of all the audio files on his computer, and then he went to the GEMA with maybe 60,000, I don't know, uh, tracks, and with all forms of all the different samples that he used. And there's, there's a whole video online, he has this little van full of paper, and then he goes to the GEMA and he says, yeah, this is the things that I want to declare. And they had to, uh, yeah, so, yeah. We, we also had similar things when programming Emosynth, yeah. Cool, thank you so much, Valerie, for this really engaging talk. Thank you. I really hope your tracks will make it on the Voyager disc one day. Yes, yeah, that would be great, yes. Um, just as a little reminder, in about 15 minutes, we're about to start the music pool Berlin community evening. It's really worth sticking around for the next panel on digital music infrastructures. So, see you back in 15 minutes.